Uh, yes, please. Oh, and uh, there's a shared Google Doc for taking notes for this workshop. Uh, the link is in the description uh, in Straight Jacket in the, in the workshop calendar, uh, right at the bottom of the first slide. And this will not crash my laptop. Honest. Don't crash. Yay. Uh, all right. So do it. Uh, updated disclaimer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, something about college. This is the phase where you transition from the instructor is the unquestioned authority. Everything's black and white and true to uh, now things have many shades of gray and uh, what works for me might not work for you, uh, but we should have an intelligent conversation about why that might be. Page. Oh, sorry. Ah, there. So yeah, how did I get into audio? Uh, well, after I gave up dreams of being an astronaut, I decided I would uh, be a rock star. So you know, always with the realistic goals. And uh, these were some of my inspirations. Bonus points if you can identify all of these bands. <laughs> um, but the point of that uh, lesson learned thing at the bottom, uh, when I started taking guitar lessons, uh, I realized that familiar music had stuff in it that I hadn't heard before, specifically in the guitar parts. And I reasoned that that was probably true about all the other instruments, so I learned the other instruments. Not well, but well enough to know what they were capable of. So that led eventually to me being a concert audio engineer. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and that's <laughs> an edited version of what uh, Wikipedia's article says about what uh, live sound is all about. Uh, I'm going to share this with you later so you guys can read that um, if you're curious about uh, the details. But that was my workstation. appropriate mix for the type of music in the venue, whether it was indoors or outdoors. Outdoors, huge, huge challenge. Uh, and that was the biggest concert I ever did was the Dynamo Festival in 89. Uh, so after uh, my career in thrash metal bands uh, was looking questionable, uh, I fell into game design. Uh, I always thought it would be an awesome career, but when I was your age, they didn't have university degree programs, and it just, again, didn't seem like a realistic pursuit. Um, I wasn't directly responsible for audio design on any of these titles, but I did have something to say about it. And in particular, on the X-Wing game, I started to learn some important uh, production uh, project management lessons. Uh, in those days, we were in DOS and the screen resolutions were crap. <laughs> I just lost my notes, sorry. Come back notes. did that. That's sort of crippling. Doug, do you have a uh, Google presentation? There we go. I found it. Ah. All right. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, working within the limitations and being concise, one example of that was file names in DOS were limited to eight characters. 
So every file in the game had to be descriptive with only eight characters. So we got very clever with one and two alphanumeric characters as codes. Um, similarly with radio messages, what it actually displayed in the game, uh, we were limited to 80 characters, so less than a tweet. Uh, so players don't actually want to spend a lot of time reading, especially in an action game. Uh, but at the time, 3D audio or just uh, the uh, really nice audio cards were just coming on the market, so we couldn't count on players having an audio card. It wasn't, I don't think, until the CD-ROM version of X-Wing that we actually added voice. And that was when we realized that all of those uh, mission briefings and radio messages that we had created were now going to be voiced by an actor. And uh, <laughs> we didn't, there were some things that we just didn't anticipate that was kind of silly in hindsight. Um, things like direction, giving the voice actors direction. Uh, this is a trailer. It's, it's short. From the creators of Star Wars comes a thrilling new adventure game based on the blockbuster film Skulls. Our time interceptors have located a rebel fleet orbiting the planet Torcana. Excellent. Prepare the attack. Move our star destroyers within range and launch all TIE fighter squadrons. At once, sir. The old rebellion has been crushed. The Jedi Knights again. So Which there, if they are warships. <laughs> that uh, little example of the mission briefings that became animated, uh, and also an example of uh, deliberate ambiguity. Uh, we had been writing information uh, that was detailed and precise. You will encounter so many ships of a certain type, and then during the level balancing and tuning phase, we realized we needed to change that, and then we had to go rewrite everything. So we came up with the clever scheme of, let's just refer to things in vague terms. <laughs> and so rather than you will encounter six TIE fighters, you will encounter uh, TIE fighter squadron alpha. Uh, and so then it left it open. Um, uh, I'm going to get to the sound effects shortly because I know that's more relevant to you. Uh, the things that I was worried about or concerned about uh, in terms of my writing uh, Cutscenes obviously are, are mostly for story. Mission briefings, uh, critical information for the player regarding objectives, what's going on, uh, plus some story. And then the radio messages are also a little bit of story, but more critical updates of information as you go. And what's what are termed barks, uh, when NPCs call out, I'm hit, or good shot, any of those kind of things, those are barks. And uh, it was actually kind of a challenge when you have to write three to ten variations on the same basic message for six different voice actors. <laughs> uh, try to get creative and not too repetitive. Uh, and then, yeah, the direction versus delivery. This one was something that happened uh, repeatedly with LucasArts audio department. Uh, and it's not unusual, Will, Will Davis will back me up on this. <coughs> Quite frequently, the line as written just doesn't come across well when the voice actor uh, reads it. And they'll struggle with it up to a point and then they'll just give up. It's like, we need to rewrite this. And that's fine, as long as you preserve the meaning. Uh, on TIE Fighter, they didn't preserve the meaning. Uh, in fact, they did something horrible, which, damn it, why does that do that? Bad. Yeah. Um, 
they rewrote a lot of lines and there were literally thousands of voice files and they didn't keep notes on anything that they changed. So then I had to spend about a week uh, listening to every single line, comparing it against what was written, and then if it was different, I had to change the text. That, it literally delayed shipping the game by a week. Uh, the person responsible didn't want to talk to me <laughs> when I wanted to talk to her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and there's just some funny things about direction. You, you'd think a line that says, uh, they're launching torpedoes at us, would be voiced with some concern, <laughs> maybe some alarm. Uh, no, we're going to deliver that deadpan because you didn't tell us exactly how you wanted it delivered. Um, Bloodwake, I got a lot more involved in the audio, uh, at, partly because I was uh, officially the lead designer and so I could uh, have some say in it. Uh, because we were doing a combat game, uh, and because I like hard rock and heavy metal, and I think that's the perfect accompaniment for when you're killing people and blowing things up, uh, I wanted a heavy music theme, or a heavy music soundtrack, uh, but we also had this setting that was uh, an alternate history Earth uh, in basically the South China Seas. And so we wanted to bring in uh, Asian themes into that music and we did that by using some uh, Asian instruments uh, to voice some of the, the melodies or some of the, the rhythms uh, and using some kind of Asian music tropes as well. And it actually, I thought it came out really well. I was, I was really happy with our audio team on the music. Uh, I was less happy with uh, some of the sound effects. Not that the sound effects were bad, I just didn't think they were mixed well. And the examples I, I give are uh, the engine sounds and the uh, combat sounds. They, they didn't have the <laughs> oomph that I thought that they needed, particularly the engines. If you've ever been around a, a high-powered uh, small boat, it's, they're like race cars in terms of the power of the engine. And so, you know, something like that uh, catamaran uh, it would have like an 1800 horsepower engine. Those get pretty loud when you're revving them at full speed. And they, they just didn't capture that. They did go to the trouble to actually record real engine sounds. I tried to get them to use my uh, GMC Sierra pickup truck with the uh, 5.7 liter V8 Flowmaster exhaust, pretty beefy, <laughs> but they declined. Um, the other thing that really bugged me was the audio director was very anti-gun uh, as in real world, I don't like guns. And I respected that, but I really, really wanted him to come down to the gun range with me so that he could hear what guns actually sound like when you're right next to them. And if you haven't experienced that, it will open your eyes. It's not what you've experienced in Hollywood films and video games. Um, I took my wife to the shooting range for the first time, and they get really excited. Oh, you gotta try this, here, try this, here, try this. <laughs> When they got up to the AR-15, <laughs> she pulls the trigger. There's this huge muzzle flash. She literally jumps out of her shoes. <laughs> oh my God, I have to go caught. <laughs> um, and yeah, he flat out refused. I was like, oh man, that's an opportunity missed. Um, the, the riskiest thing that we tried to do with Blood Wake was uh, use create a radar that didn't have a screen element. And my solution was to have your first mate just call things out, you know, torpedo off the port bow. And uh, conceptually that sounded reasonable, but you can imagine how it could be less than optimal if it got really repetitive, especially if the voice actor's voice started to get on your nerves. Um, I don't think we actually gave it a fair chance uh, to be implemented properly before just throwing up our hands and saying, you know what, let's just do radar, because radar, we understand, and it works. And then I got into a fight with a producer on how radar works. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. No one was doing the buttons. Oh, do you want to see that? We actually had an ad. I want to back up, because that was cool. 
We had a very short little ad. First game I worked on that had TV ads. They actually did a whole series of them. There was uh, four of them, and uh, they were all pretty good. I was I, I wished that they would have shared them with me so that I could keep copies. Where did my mouse go? There we go. What the heck just happened to the resolution on this? Uh, ye gods. Uh, okay, that's disturbing. Uh, is that where I want to be? It is. Um, so after Blood Wake, I worked at Starbreeze. Uh, I was lead designer on Riddick for the middle third of development. Um, wh while I was there, uh, they asked me to do some uh, incidental voices for Knights of the Temple. Uh, a pre-alpha or alpha version of Riddick, because I was the only native English speaker at the studio, all of the voices are me. <laughs> and I, I think I pulled off a reasonable impression of Riddick. I waited till I'd done all the other voices and my voice had gotten naturally raspy and I'd drop it down a little bit and uh, it, it kind of worked. <laughs> this is not working. This isn't working. Uh, oh, and the Punisher at Volition. Um, again, just some incidental thug voices, uh, mostly grunts of pain. <laughs> <laughs> and here's uh, Foley recording. You know what that is? Uh, okay. So uh, we have this small office space set up as a recording studio. And uh, I'm in there with the audio engineer and swearing loudly. <laughs> and a new employee in the office next door becomes concerned and asks, what's going on? And he is told, oh, it's Westman, don't worry about it, he's got Tourette's. And, oh, okay, fine. The fun part on the Foley, I had to do, uh, okay, Castle has his gun in your mouth. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I got a little bit of water. And, <laughs> and it sounded so real. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't get any chipped teeth out of the deal. Um, but it was fun. Uh, so here we get to where I actually, that was my main role for about six months of the project. Uh, when I first came onto the team, uh, they had me be the lead designer, lead game designer. Uh, and that was, uh, seemed to be going fine, but uh, yeah, halfway through it, they decided uh, another guy who had been on the project, uh, well, had been on the first project, uh, would be a better lead designer than I was. I had never done this type of game before. Uh, initially, I was upset, but after thinking about it, I realized, no, that's, that's the smart decision. And they were, they were happy with me. They weren't, say, they weren't gonna let me go. Uh, and they, in fact, uh, gave me the option to stay on the project and just pick something else to do or move to some other team. And because uh, the studio's regular full-time audio people uh, were both on extended leaves of, of absence, I thought I'd step into that role. It allowed me to kind of full circle back to when I was an audio guy before getting into the games industry. It was incredible fun uh, learning new tools. And I worked with an outside contracting team uh, to get most of the sound effects produced. Um, and you know, they'd send them back to me. I'd decide whether or not they were suitable, uh, send them back if I needed some adjustments. And over time, I started to get uh, proficient enough with the editing tools that I could do some of the simple edits myself. And uh, we did eventually run out of money. We, we spent our budget and they said, sorry, yeah, we can't do any more sounds for you. But I need more sounds. There's some sounds we didn't think of when we created our asset list with hundreds and hundreds of sound effects on it. And so I, I had to figure out how to do some complicated sounds. Uh, the 
one challenge in that area that to this day just boggles my mind. Uh, there's a creature in one of the levels, it's a robotic centipede. <coughs> and so the, the real beefy part of my job on this project at this point in time was implementing those sounds. So I had to uh, go into the scripting for the character animations and the weapon animations and uh, every object that would be placed as a prop that would have a sound, like here's an electric generator. It's got a loop sound of a generator humming. Um, it was one of my proudest achievements. I got the tink, tink, tink of the robotic centipede crawling across the c uh, cement floor perfectly timed, perfectly synced, and I come in to play the latest build, and all of a sudden the centipede now has wheels. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> and the art lead was, yeah, yeah, we changed it. Didn't occur to you that it might impact what I'm doing? You might want to ask me if my thoughts on the matter? Nope. <laughs> and I could tell he wasn't going to be receptive to any changes so I had to scramble that was the toughest one coming up with something that worked because my tools at that time weren't sophisticated enough to do uh, multi-track layering and adjusting the individual layers in a nice sophisticated way that you guys have access to all kinds of free tools that allow you to do that um, so at this point I have I think I have one more slide about, the, oh yeah, I have some footage from Death Junior 2, Root of Evil. Uh, it was later ported to the Wii. Um, I didn't think the Wii version, I, th somehow they managed to break some things. I don't know how they managed to do that. Oh, that's as loud as I got it, sorry. Uh, you can't really hear it so well in the mix here, the footstep sounds. Boy, what a lot of fun that is. <laughs> um, the PSP is a handheld device with limited capacity for memory. And so my budget for all of the sound effects in any given level was two megabytes. If you've played with audio files, you know how ridiculously small that is. So I had to come up with some clever tricks. Uh, one of the best tricks is if your sound is a low register, low, low tones, uh, you can get away with an 8-bit sound. Normally, everything's at 16-bit or better. But the, the human ear, you, most people can't distinguish those, those low tones, the difference between an 8-bit and a 16-bit. And an 8-bit is half the memory size, so huge savings. Um, with the footsteps, you need variations. You can't have the exact same footstep sound because then it sounds robotic and completely unlifelike. So we did uh, in-engine processing as the, so as the sound is being played back. It's given a very slight tweak, uh, changing the register a little bit, uh, changing the volume just a little bit. So you only need a handful of sounds for each different material type. And as they play back, it sounds much more varied. So the practical aspects of planning, organizing, uh, implementing all of this, I thought I would share some actual documents from that project. Um, in some ways, this game was uh, well, I'll, let's say it was the most poorly received, or the least well received. The review scores were six and seven, which hurt. <laughs> um, and 
it was one of those situations where at the start of the project, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, you have these terrific ideas, all this excitement, and great plans, and then things don't work out the way you planned, and you have to reduce scope, remove features, and that's what happened with, with this project. We weren't able to staff up according to the plan, and that meant sacrificing major features, which I think could have gotten us up to an eight in the review scores. <laughs> Um, let's see if I can show you one other goofy bit. Uh, one of the things that I loved about this project was uh, the incredible freedom to go a little crazy with the level design. So this is like this uh, haunted toy graveyard. And so you face these lethal teddy bears and uh, baby little uh, baby dolls that very cute, but they would sit down and drop a load that would then explode. <laughs> um, uh, of course, army men. Uh, and the boss of this level is a giant robot that has multiple attack modes. All those pain sounds, again, that's something that's gonna get really repetitive really quickly. Uh, so you wanna have as much variation as you can possibly fit in to whatever memory constraints you have. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to check this out on Wii or, or PSP, I think it's a fun game. Um, I got sore thumbs playing it. <laughs> uh, all right, so on to practical stuff. Uh, da, 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 where did I put that folder? Oh, here we go. All right, so. Uh, This is the asset list. I've got three of these so I can show you the progression. Um, so we've got different tabs for music, for interface sound effects, player characters and allies, enemies, bosses, environment, weapons. Uh, pretty basic at that stage. Uh, about five months later. Is it just open now? Oh, excellent. Uh, you can see that it's getting a bit more elaborate. Where did my mouse go? Um, so we're getting more specific in categorizing things, uh, starting to add actual file names. Um, how, let's see, let's go up to that. So yeah, the uh, different uses of the sounds. Again, notice the uh, file name convention so that things are easily organized and found when you need them. Uh, lots and lots of weapon sound effects. I have lots of fun designing some of these weapons. Uh, also with the enemies. Now here it gets quite elaborate. <laughs> uh, there are quite a few different enemy types. And so each one typically needs this whole range of sounds for movement, for dodging, for melee attacks, for range of attack, when it's getting hit and when it dies. And ambient sounds. This is the one that's probably the most important to you guys. And I, even though those uh, audio guys weren't actively uh, working, 
they were available and they hired a new, a new audio guy who had tr a tremendous amount of experience and was able to coach me and mentor me into some uh, much better results. One of the things I learned about ambient sounds is it's not just a collection of sounds that you place in your level. You have to think about the acoustics of the environment itself, right? So if you're in a, in a small cave, that sounds, your voice, a footstep, a smack, is gonna sound very different than if it's out in a field. And so the, the audio engineer t term for it is room tone. You establish a room tone first, and then you, s you tailor your sound effects to what's, what's there in the room. It can get complicated if it's uh, a sound that's attached to something that can move through, it, through the environment. In that case, you're, you're gonna have to rely on some real-time processing to alter the effects, uh, how the sounds uh, are heard. Looping hamburger tram ride sound. That sounds good. Gurgling fat grease river. <laughs> uh, descriptive. Uh, and then I think is it? Yeah. And then we've got all these props. Um, that doesn't seem like a long enough list. So let's take a look at the last file that I have, which is pretty near ship date. This is from September 06. Uh, everything. Uh, so we decided to put all the sounds into one sheet. How smart was that? No, that doesn't look right. Oh, wait, go the other way. Yeah. Uh, notice another thing about the naming convention. Any sound that's a looping sound, it's identified as such. Music, music I didn't have a, a strong direct role in. Uh, also with the voice, I was primarily focused on sound effects. Um, the UI sound effects, not a lot there. Uh, you don't really need a lot. Some people get carried away with that. They think they need a different sound for every button press. And really you just need generic button press. Um, so I will give you guys access to all this if uh, you find it interesting. Um, yeah, this is just very similar to the last one. So, ah, there we go. It does seem like there's a bit more in the props category, finally. Um, and I want to get to some Q&A, but first, uh, at the very, very high level, Okay, sure. Um, what did our milestones look like? So it's interesting, some of these milestones have nothing to say about audio. <laughs> um, it's an unfortunate truth that still, Ten years later, from what I hear, uh, audio is not fully appreciated or respected uh, among other developers, which is just mind-boggling to me. Uh, in the film industry, they understand that audio is like half the experience. And it's been proven that sound affects how you see things. So you can enhance the visuals by clever use of sound. And waiting until the last minute, which is what typically happens to add the audio, it's like, oh shoot, you know, we, we're three months from shipping, let's get some audio in there. <laughs> uh, usually doesn't work out so well. Um, I think just like testing, you wanna get that process started as early as possible. On the Riddick game, it was a dramatic change in the uh, user experience when we added full audio. The uh, first person shooter part of the game, uh, the gameplay mechanics, the controls, was all you know, well understood, worked fine. Visually, it was great. The, uh, the lead programmer at Starbreeze at that time when I joined the team, they told me, he's the Swedish John Carmack. 
like, ooh. <laughs> um, so they had a really, really great engine, looked beautiful, um, but and we're playing, and it just feels flat. It's just not having the impact that we want. And overnight, when we got the sound in, particularly with combat sound effects, having near miss sounds, bullets spattering against the wall next to your head, uh, adds a lot of excitement. <laughs> and yeah, it completely transformed the experience. Uh, so moving through the months, you see that they're finally starting to add some things relevant, relevant to the audio. Uh, so, and this, this uh, idea of doing multiple passes through the documentation, through the implementation, uh, it's, that's the way you do it. It's, it's an iterative process. Uh, you don't get it right the first time ever, and so you need to give yourself time to get it right. Uh, what do I have here? DJ sound effects. This one, this is the file that the game used to read the files. And here's where we could do some runtime processing to make those uh, changes. So in here where it says alternate loop, some of these sound effects, uh, they were labeled to indicate that there were more than one choice that could be uh, run when it got triggered. Mass distance. We actually had there was another setting. Uh, you want to set the the volume fall off for a sound effect. Do you want your sound effect to be heard all the way across the level, or only if you're close to it? And how close to it do you have to be uh, before you begin to hear it? Um, the other thing is prioritization. category level. Uh, what sounds have to be heard? Going back to X-Wing or, or TIE Fighter where we introduced the verbosity setting for the, for the uh, radio messages. All that color stuff, the barks, would get tiresome. You could go as a player, toggle a setting that would just remove all that stuff and you would only hear the stuff that really matters. Um, with a limited number of channels for audio playback, there's definitely a possibility that you're gonna trigger way more sounds than the engine can actually handle. So how do you decide which sounds have priority? You, you need to design that. You need to de deliberately decide these sounds must be heard, these sounds should be heard, these sounds we can, we can let those fall off. They're not really important if other sounds are playing that have higher priority. enemy description, but some of the crazy enemies that we had. Um, <laughs> the robotic chickens with laser eyes, that was one of my favorites. Um, and, oh, I actually have some, no, that's not gonna work. Oh, this is the, yeah, <laughs> here's an example of the scripting that I had to do uh, for the sounds to play back. Fun stuff. I think that's about it. I probably overlooked a few of the little anecdotal bits, but we don't have a whole lot of time left. So how about questions? Um, you, even at the start though, you should have a rough idea of sort of general categories of sounds so you can have that as like a prefix. Um, and certainly if you're gonna do a bunch of variations, it's, you know, increment the digit at the end of the file. <laughs> um, 
And, and don't be afraid to change your naming convention. Um, you can overdo that, and I upset more than one team by coming up, I've got a better naming convention. <laughs> We're not gonna rename everything. You did. So I, w I went online and I found a tool that lets you do a batch processing <laughs> and update all the file names. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's, it definitely saves you a little bit of heartbreak that is almost assuredly going to bite you in the ass if you don't have a sensible naming convention. Um, well, two things. Uh, the, the length of the sound is in, has a direct relationship to the memory footprint, the size of the file. Um, so it was uh, an easy way to sort what are the longest sounds, can I make them shorter? <laughs> you know, uh, or I, can I shrink the file size by making it an 8-bit sound instead of a 16-bit sound? That, I think that was the main purpose for that. Um, some of the things about how you tailor the actual uh, sound file that and how it gets triggered. The way the engine worked, there was just a slight delay between the command that says, yes, play the sound to when it's actually played. So that went into the scripting, which frame does this get triggered? The animation starts on frame 17. I'm gonna trigger the sound to start on frame 16. That kind of trick. Um, and uh, making sure that you're, uh, you normalize the volumes of all your sound effects. Ideally, they all have basically the same middle volume and it's the playback, the runtime uh, trigger that determines how, how loud it actually is at playback. Um, and I can't remember the rationale behind that, but it was very important, I was told. <laughs> uh, I, think it's, I think it has to do with when you get into adjusting uh, some of the parameters of an audio file, uh, you, you wanna leave what's called headroom some, uh, for, for dynamic range and for making adjustments, particularly for sounds that, that have uh, uh, significant volume changes just as, as a part of that, that's the sound effect. It starts quiet and it gets loud or vice versa. Um, so le leaving yourself some room to manipulate it, uh, that was facilitated by having all of the sounds more or less in the same range. Um, something that's done in modern music, which is, the opposite of that and was done when CD-ROMs, uh, CD, when CDs took over the music industry, uh, they found that they could artificially like inflate each instrument's sound so that everything sounded loud and that worked really well played back through radios and it had a very negative impact on the actual music, in my opinion, because it, it wiped out the feel of dynamics. If you truly appreciate music, you, you know that it's better if there's some highs and lows, some fast, some slow. If it's all one thing, it starts to get boring. Uh, but I've gone off tangent there, so back to level design sound. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely part of the design. Um, yeah. Uh, I put them there. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I should have copied over uh, an example of one of the level design docs. So the level design doc, uh, like the ones that you've created, 
It's primarily a description of the environment, what gameplay is happening there, but it also has a section that is, is a, a, a preliminary asset list. For this level, I'm gonna need some, I'm gonna need a waterfall sound because there's a waterfall on my level. And so then, yeah, all of that gets pulled into the spreadsheet and uh, generally try to avoid sounds that can only be used once. Um, you know, you wanna get the most bang for your buck. Um, and sometimes, like, like a creature sound, uh, you play it back at a low register for one creature and a higher register and with some other little uh, digital processing tricks to make it sound different, but it's essentially the same sound that you created. You're just able to manipulate it so it sounds different. That was one of the, the things that uh, I guess surprised me a little bit was how simple it was to alter a sound with just one or two parameters and get something completely different. And later I discovered that the contractors that I had hired had been cheating a little bit. Uh, they, this was utterly legal to do, I'm not sure it's entirely ethical, but they had purchased sound effects libraries. And so they go down the list of th things that I'm asking for and well, we've got a lot of these right in the library, so here you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you didn't actually do any work. I feel cheated. Um, but I did give them plenty of sounds that they, they had to do the work. They had to create from scratch. Um, yes. Can I roll with the same saturation that you had? Have lots of people listen to it. Uh, yeah, it's the same with, with uh, you know, playtesting feedback. Um, in fact, that's, you know, when you do a playtest, you might, uh, as part of the playtest or as the main focus of this playtest session, you want to get feedback on the audio. So the questions you ask the playtesters all have to do with what, what do you think about the sounds? You, you know, does, does the sound environment sound right? Is there anything about the sound that annoyed you? Specifically, it's for radio stations. That's the. Um, I would start with just listening to a lot of talk show radio to get a feel for it. If you if you're not already familiar with it, and. Uh, oh oh okay. Um, okay, I I would do research on what do what do the guys in the control tower actually say? What kind of language do they use? Um, this is actually on Starfighter Inc., a, a problem that ar arose with our writer not wanting to do any research, and so he's just making shit up. And I'm like, that's not what they say. <laughs> you know, in two minutes, I've got, here, this website explains it. This is the procedure, you know. It's like, and they're, they're very precise. There's international conventions uh, for uh, air traffic controllers and for handling emergencies at sea. You know, there, we use these phrases, we repeat it three times, then we say this, then we say this, then we repeat that three times. You know, it's, it's all very uh, specifically laid out. That's a pretty vague question. <laughs> Very open-ended. Um, experiment. Um, I, I'm not afraid to copy what other people have done. You know, if, if, if I know there's a game out there or a movie that has something that I think is going to be close to what I need, um, I'll 
not necessarily directly copy it, but I'll definitely be inspired by it, um, get my ideas there, see if there's something I could do that, that elevates it a bit. Um, there, there are some sound effects that you've probably all heard many, many times um, because they come from those libraries and uh, there's like a California red-tailed hawk that <coughs> sound that is used in tons and tons of movies and TV shows. It's the exact same sound effect file. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Come up with something a little bit different. Um, but again, it's like a, making small adjustments uh, on the musical scale. You know, if if the if the sound effect would register as like a C sharp or middle C, changing it to a, a, an F is enough sometimes. Um, adding very subtle bits of reverb or phase shifting, uh, you, you can make it sound very different. And of course, layering the sounds. Here's an identifiable, <coughs> a very identifiable sound. Here's another one and here's another one. When I mash them together, it's like, what the heck is that? Um, if you look up uh, on uh, YouTube, I'm sure you can find some documentaries about filmmakers and how they achieve different sound effects. Um, and some of them are really fascinating. It's like, you know, how, did, how did you get that alien sound? And oh, we combined uh, a little bit of cougar and a little bit of uh, diesel motor and <laughs> like, what? And it's like, yeah, and that was, that's the sound. It's like, that's really cool. Um, it's, I think it's one of the fun things about working with sound is, is it invites experimentation and uh, you will stumble across things that are just really cool and might not be what you were looking for, but I want to figure out where we can use this <laughs> and actually go back to design. It's like, can you use this sound? This is a really cool sound. <laughs> like, All right, yes, we will create a new weapon just for that sound. <laughs> alternate fire mode. Um, I mean, this is something, uh, I don't know if, if uh, it's probably beyond scope for the year two people in uh, doing their level design, but you should be focusing on the sound effects that are gonna uh, match up to props and the atmosphere and the ambient environment. Uh, but if, if you find yourself having a good time with this, take a look at how uh, the sounds are applied to the weapons uh, and the characters and see if you can just substitute some different sound files and see if you come up with something fun that way. genre in the sense of science fiction versus fantasy versus mystery. Uh, in fantasy and science fiction, you can get away with a lot of that. Uh, in something that's more real world, not so much. Because, um, yeah, it kind of depends on what the player's expectations are. If, if the environment they're walking around in looks like the real world, then they're going to expect the real world sound. So something like that can sound out of place. But if it's a science fiction or a fantasy setting, it's like, I'm casting this spell. It's, it's just like that other, it's the same spell, or it's the same sound effect file that we use for another spell. We've just reversed it and lowered it two octaves. <laughs> you, yeah, that you can totally get away with. You done? I think we're done. Yes, we're done. <laughs> oh, one more question. Hello. audio Bible, like an art Bible. Um, we, we didn't. Um, it, I don't think that occurred to me at the time. Um, since then, I've certainly thought about it. And uh, for the audio lead on Starfighter, I proposed that he create such a document and model it on the 
very well done art bible that our lead artist created. Um, yeah, it's uh, even with a small team, it's it's not. Uh, it's it's an exercise that can be a significant amount of work and on a small team, small project, that might be overkill. Um, but certainly for larger projects uh, where you can expect there's going to be some changes in the team with new people coming on, that really helps everybody get up to speed with that aspect of the game. Have you found a good audio Bible? We did have general audio design documents, which you know you could term them a Bible. Uh, I just they weren't as elaborate as the, what I've seen as an art Bible. Um, <laughs> which reminds me, Exling Alliance. I wish we had a Bible. Um, you, the player character is part of this family that they're in the middle between the rebels and the Imperials. They're trying to stay neutral. Um, and I don't know why, but uh, the audio director decided that one of the voice actors in your family would have an Irish accent. Just one of them. <laughs> is he adopted? <laughs> why, does this, why does this guy have an Irish accent? I think because the audio director was Irish. <laughs> and he hired a pal, I don't know. Uh, since we're over the clock, I'm just gonna uh, do some silliness. When we were doing Darth Vader lines, I had I designed a few missions where uh, you fly alongside Darth Vader, and I wrote dialogue that I thought was the kind of things that Darth Vader would say to you as a pilot of how to how to be a better pilot <laughs> for the Empire, and Lucas Arts told me to tone it down. Too dark, they said. This is way too dark. But he's the ultimate personification of evil. <laughs> it should be dark. Too dark. Um, and the voice actor that they hired to do, to imitate Darth Vader's voice, uh, did not do a very good job, in my opinion. It was pretty weak. And I felt that I could probably do better, maybe. I knew my brother could do better. He's very talented in that way. So we got together, put a bucket over our head. <laughs> um, mine was okay, but my brother nailed it. So take it in. Hey, Larry, you know, my brother did a really good Darth Vader impression. How about this? I said, yeah, this is really good. Yeah, we can use this. And so I'm stoked. And my brother is like, I'm going to be in a game. I did the voice of Darth Vader. And then Lucas Arts says, "No, no, 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 no. We handle all the voices. Just no." Nope. Aww. <laughs> right. That's it. <laughs>